Chat Shalom. Today we're learning, continuing learning from the Hebrew prayer book, the Siddur, and we have been learning the Avinu Malkinu prayer, which is something that is read um, during times of fasting. So um, before we begin, we are doing this learning only solely for the purpose of glorifying God. May it be that he is glorified through our time. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Baruch Hashem. Let's make the next few minutes last forever. So the lesson is Avinu Malkinu. We'll be concluding our Avinu Malkinu prayers. Please be in prayer about the next place we should go. Uh, the next prayer. The title is Tisha B'Av. Humility, oneness, a 10 out of 10. How to feel? Ashamed? Because I lost control this week. My anger and my rage. Disappointment and fury uncaged, on stage, loud, roaring, and yet he remains true and faithful, an outpouring of love and adoring. Why is he so kind? Why does he take all the tender love and time? To heal my heart, my body, and my mind. It's been trying. It's been hard to find the time for all. And still, here we are. I fall into his hands and always wonder, always awe, at how he places the pieces together and lets the abundance fall. Open wide the mouths of your vessels. Let him fill you to the brim and overwhelm you from within. So yesterday was the fast of the 5th, Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av. We looked in depth at the many at many significant things which took place over the pages of history for the Jewish people, falling out all on this same fateful day. I learned how hard and truly amazing, strategically uh, competently, the zealots fought to save the city, to hold off the Romans at the time of the siege in 70 A.D., they had the Romans push back, even digging under the walls to attack them. My son asked me, how could they have fought so hard and lasted so long without God with them? It was a good question. I feel that perhaps it wasn't that God was not with them. It was more that in this case, he was not going to fight for them on their behalf. And if you look at the play-by-play -play of this siege and battles, which lasted for three weeks from the 17th of Tammuz, you can see how the city would have pulled into itself, and then you would have these zealots at the, as the last line of defense against the might of the Roman forces. They stood in front of the old women, the children. It was like the grown man guarding his family. Am Yisrael, at that moment, must have looked around them and realized, although it was too late, they were one family. The book of Aika, Lamentations, written by the hand of Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, gives us a glimpse into what had gone so terribly wrong within them. We often think about the destruction of Saddam and Gomorrah being based upon the notion of sexual immorality within it. The homosexuality, namely, is what is commonly mentioned as the cause. While this was, was a factor, the sages teach, that it was a place that historically was completely void of compassion. There was no hospitality, and anyone doing a good deed there would be terribly punished. The sages do not come for no reason with these notions. So let's take a look at what the prophet Yirmiyahu tells us. I'm pausing it for just... So Sam is going to read for us Aika Lamentations. She's reading chapter 5 and verse 5 through 6, and then 13 through 16. All right. Those who ate delicacies are desolate in the streets. Those reared in purple embrace ash pits. For the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the sin of Sodom, which was overthrown as in a moment, and no hands were turned toward her. Because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests, who have shed in her midst the blood of the righteous, they wandered, blind, in the streets. They were defiled with blood so that no one could touch their garments. Depart, unclean, they cried of themselves. Depart, depart, do not touch. So they fled and wandered. 
men among the nations said, They shall not continue to dwell with us. The presence of the Lord has scattered them. He will not continue to regard them. They did not honor the priests. They did not favor the elders. Thank you. So what is the job of a prophet? What is the purpose of a true prophet? Um, so Abraham, Yehoshua, um, Yehezke, or Hezekiel um, states, the prophet is a man who feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul, and he is bowed and stunned at man's fierce greed. Frightful is the agony of man. No human voice can convey its full terror. Prophecy is the voice that God has lent to the silent agony, a voice to the plundered poor, to the profaned riches of the world. It is a form of living, a crossing point of God and man. God is raging in the prophet's words. Yumiyahu is telling us that the one, ones responsible were the priests and the prophets. The prophets specifically were not doing their job. The job of a prophet is not only to warn the people of what is to come. Almost always, it is God's righteous judgment just on the horizon. His job is to inspire the people to repentance. Yirmiyahu had been trying fervently to warn his people of the coming wrath, but the other false prophets were feeding them falsehood, false visions and oracles. Lord, there is so much of this going on today, so much distraction. Central to every prophet's message is the return to the Torah of Hashem, to repent and uphold the righteous gift for upright living, the Torah, the teaching of Hashem. That's what that is. So we will see in detail more about this thought as Aika goes on. And Sam's going to continue reading Aika Lamentations 2. She's reading 13 through 14 for us. How shall I admonish you? To what shall I compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? To what shall I liken you as I comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is as vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity. But they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. So um, another quote from Heshkel. Prophetic utterance is rarely cryptic. Suspended between God and man, it is urging, alarming, forcing onward, as if the words gushed forth from the heart of God, seeking entrance into the heart and mind of man, carrying a summons as well as an involvement. Grandeur, not dignity, is important. The language is luminous and explosive, firm and contingent, harsh and compassionate, a fusion of contradictions. The prophet seldom tells a story but casts events. He rarely sings but castigates. He does more than translate reality into a poetic key. He is a preacher whose purpose is not self-expression or the purgation of emotions, but communication. His images must not shine, they must burn. Reading the words of the prophet is a strain on the emotions, wrenching one's conscience from the state of suspended animation. And so you can see from this, I mean, just based on this understanding, I can think of, there's many faces that flock in front of my eyes of people who call themselves prophets today. And it's, it's all about them. It's the them show, literally, in so many cases. And this is not really at all what a true prophet is. It's, so we're going to expand on that idea as we go along. This is precisely what Yermayahu was attempting to do, to um, cry out to his people, to his king, to his elders and fellow Levites, to his family and to his friends. His message is rejected and they clink instead to a false sense of comfort. What would you do? What would I do? Really think about it. One person is promising destruction and terror, the horrors that seem unimaginable. 
that God will reject the apple of his eye and even destroy his own house? Or the others say, comfort, peace, nothing bad is going to happen. Or, like is being done today, we're going to miss it all. We won't be a part of it. We're, we're, we're immune to tribulation. So now we're going to read, Sam is going to read for us, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah 14. She is reading verse 13 through 16. But, ah, Lord God, I said, look, the prophets are telling them, you will not see the sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you lasting peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who they are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them. Yet they keep saying, there will be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall meet their end to whom they are prophesying, will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and there will be no one to bury them, neither them, nor their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour out their wickedness on them. And go ahead and read that next one, too. The prophets are as wind, and the word is not in them. Thus, them. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it will consume them. And that's Jeremiah 13 and 14. Thank you. So clearly we see what is being put on these false prophets, and God is saying his word is not in them. This is not from him. From old, Hashem warned his people about how to spot a false prophet. There are many people setting dates out there, declaring words, so to speak. I've got a word and, um, and visions from the Lord. I've seen all kinds of videos of these people having dreams and visions. Look, I don't want to discount them. And a lot of it, I mean, it rings true to me, um, but... But we have to be careful by claiming God is coming from directly from God at any rate. Um, if these declarations and dates are in error, even to the slightest degree, we're actually commanded and besought in warning not to continue to learn from or listen to these people any longer. In days of old, their words would be cut off in the most extreme sense of the word. Since we don't have the righteous Torah courts to send these people through, if we were to do so, at the very least, it is incumbent upon us to cease from listening or promoting or sharing their false expressions. They are not of Hashem. So Sam's going to read for us Devarim, Deuteronomy 19, and verse 20 through 22. And then she's reading Devarim, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4. And, and maybe unmute and start over. I, every time I click on it, it keeps scrolling down at me. I'm sorry. No <laughs> okay. All right. Devarim 19, verse 20. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And then Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go off after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments. 
listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. So this is super important. Um, this is the case in which they, the prophet is coming and saying something's going to happen or providing some kind of supernatural sign. And God says, even if this person does this and it comes true and everything is according to, to spot on what he said or did or this miraculous thing took place, if that same person is telling you to turn aside from the Torah of Hashem, to not keep his commandments, it doesn't matter then in that case if he everything he said came about or if he provided some kind of miraculous healing or miracle, he is still not to be trusted because any prophet who comes and saying to go against the Torah of Hashem, by definition, if we are talking about the eternal Bible being the final word in authority, then those are a false prophet. Jeremiah declares God's word is not in these false prophets. The truth is that no true prophet will ever leave, lead God's people away from his word, his entire word, and that includes his Torah. As we read the following section, remember that the destruction that has met Yirmiyahu's eye is meant to be the description of the worst case scenario for God's people. How much of this picture has been willingly forced upon God's people today? How much of this reality has been distorted to the point where many don't care for these extraordinarily special, divinely appointed, gifted things of Hashem? The Sabbath, His festivals, the Torah. God's worst case scenario is a vision where what Yirmiyahu is looking at is real. No feasts for the highways, for the pilgrimage festivals are empty. No Sabbaths for the holy house and the altar are burned. No Torah. Yes, this is something to mourn. So Sam's going to read us Aika Lamentations, and she's going to read 2 and verse 6 through 9. And he has violently treated his tabernacle like a garden booth. He has destroyed his appointed meeting place. Us to be forgotten, the appointed feast and Sabbath in Zion. And he has despised king and priest in the indignation of his anger. The Lord has rejected his altar. He has abandoned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the noise house of the Lord, as in the day of my appointed feast. The Lord deter determined to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not restrained his hand from destroying. It is called rampart and wall to lament that have languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the nations. The Torah is no more. Also, her prophets find no vision from the Lord. Go ahead and read that next one, too, please. Jeremiah, Yahoo, Jeremiah 6, starting at 19, or it's just 19. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their plans, because they have not listened to my words. And as for my Torah, they have rejected it also. Yirmiyahu was an advocate for God, for his Torah, calling for the people to repent and return to God. His written prophecies were burned. He was the one who, who was accused of being, he was the one accused of being a false prophet. He was thrown into a dungeon and humiliated, yet he was not consumed with hatred for the people who spurned him. No, although he was released and vindicated by the, it should say, conquering Babylonian general, Yirmiyahu sought his brothers. Aika, Lamentations, is the voice of the pure heart of a man who took the entire weight of this people upon himself. As hard and as faithfully as he related God's message to his people, with his word like a fire in his mouth, he still feels ultimately responsible for each and every one of his people in each and every ounce of their suffering. See how he, who had not rebelled nor sinned against God, 
takes upon himself this burden of guilt and responsibility. It is quite astounding. So Sam's going to now read this heart-wrenching section of Aika of Lamentations from chapter 1. She's reading 12 through 17, and this is Yirmiyahu, who really did nothing wrong, taking it all upon himself. Is it nothing to all you who pass this way? Look and see if there is any pain like my pain, which was severely dealt out to me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire into my bones, and it prevailed over them. He has spread a net for my feet. He has turned me back. He has made me desolate, faint, all day long. The yoke of my transgressions is bound. By his hand are knit together. They have come upon my neck. He has made my strength fail. The Lord has given me into the hands of those against whom I'm not able to stand. The Lord has rejected all my strong men in my midst. He has called an appointed time against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes run down with water because far from me is a couple one who restores my soul. My children are desolate because the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands. There is no one to comfort her. The Lord has commanded concerning that the ones round about him should be his adversaries. Jerusalem has become an unclean thing among them. The Lord is righteous, for I have rebelled against his command. Hear now all peoples and behold my pain. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. And then Ayeka Lamentations chapter three, verse one. I am the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely against me, he has turned his hand repeatedly all the day. So heavy. This English translation loses something which expresses to me the weight of Yermiyahu's feeling in this verse. A little tiny word, ak, only. So for a little context in Bereshit 723, thus he blotted out everything that was upon the face of the land, from man to animal to creeping things and birds of the sky that were blotted out from the earth, and only ak, Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. There's she, 2713, but his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son, only ak, obey my voice and go get them for me. And this is Rebecca telling Yaakov to go get the goats to deceive his father. There's she, 3415. Only, Ak, on this condition will we consent to you, if you will become like us, and that every male shall be circumcised. Yirmiyahu says, Only against me has God turned his hand. This man, this extraordinary man, feels entirely, utterly, completely, and totally responsible and at fault for the utter destruction he has witnessed. This is the stuff of a true leader. He doesn't say to them, I told you so. Not see the chains your sins have bought you? No, instead, he puts on the chains himself, and he feels the weight of those chains. So we're out of time for this section. We're going to stop our recording here. Please join us for part two.